Okay, well, we need, do need to be praying for John Hayden, too. He's been sick, and, and we need to, been really sick, so we need to be bringing him before the Lord also. Um, he, I texted him yesterday, and he said he had 104 fever. It's, uh, it's down today, but he still, we still need to be praying for him. And we need to remember Debbie. So let's, let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Psalm 53 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And this pretty much describes our society today as it denies you, the family, masculinity and femininity, and, and truth itself. And David goes on to say that, that God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand or who seek God, and every one of them has turned aside. They've together become corrupt, and there's none who does good, no, not one. And this is where we are today in a, as a society, which seems to be bereft of, any, of a moral compass. Finally, David says in, in this psalm that uh, they're in great fear, where no fear was. And that's, again, accurate description of where many people are today who don't trust you and don't know you. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance as we go into our community and help us to be a testimony to you and a witness. Help us to make a difference. Lord, uh, we also want to pray especially for Debbie as she goes in for that surgery tomorrow. We pray that you would give the doctors wisdom and skill as they perform this operation and we just pray that this would would be a, a, a great help to her. We, we think of, of John Hayden, and uh, uh, Lord, we know he's been very ill. We just pray that you would touch his body and raise him up to health again. And Lord, we don't know if there's others in our, in our group that have been sick, but we just pray that you would, you would be uh, undertaking for us as a body of believers as well. We, again, as always, pray for our military people and our law enforcement people. We pray that you would protect them as they protect us. We pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. And Lord, this morning we also pray that you would again open the eyes of our understanding as we look into your word and help us to grasp what you'd like to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are still in Corinthians, so I want to read, uh, want to read 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 10. It says, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 20,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Well, we're in an interesting section of Scripture that Paul has written, and because of, of this section of Scripture, this morning we're going to go all over. We are going to cover the whole thing. I, th I think it's going to seem like it, actually not, but we are just... Uh, what Paul is describing here in the section of Scripture we're getting into where he's going to bounce us all over. So, uh, again, we're still in Corinthians. The key verses for 1 Corinthians is uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 13. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So again, this book was written to correct problems in the church, and the theme of 1 Corinthians is unity of faith and purity of life. And now the, the Corinthians had written and asked Paul about some particular problems. We know from 1 Corinthians 7, 1, it said, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So, so Paul is still in the middle of addressing these, these questions. But before we get into anything new, 
Let's look back at some of the things that we, uh, we focused on last week. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, and thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, what did Paul mean when he said, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified? Well, in the old King James, the word that's used here is, for disqualify is cast away. And Paul was uh, confident that his salvation had nothing to do with his own efforts. And that is such a true statement. That is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. That our salvation has nothing to do with our own efforts. Our salvation is because of Jesus Christ and what he did. Paul was very well aware of that. He understood that his salvation was solely in the hands of God. And so he was not talking about losing his salvation here. He was talking about his service. He was referring to specifically his role as a spiritual leader. And I think we've all asked ourselves how a person can be a member of a church or even in full-time ministry for years and then fall into some kind of moral sin. And this is actually the focus of the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the, the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So Paul begins his chapter by addressing the part of the, the congregation that was Jewish, and, and look at, at what he says to them. He says, all our fathers were under the cloud. He's going back to the Old Testament, as he, he often does. Well, what do you think he meant by being under the cloud? Well, he means that they, were, they had guidance. Remember, God guided the Jews by giving them a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The Jews were not just out there wandering around in the wilderness. God, God was guiding them. And during their whole time in their desert wanderings, God was caring for them. Look at Deuteronomy 29.5. He says, and I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, nor your sandals have not worn out on your feet. Now, how would you ladies like to wear the same clothes for 40 years? I, I think you might not appreciate it, but it's just amazing. God led them for 40 years in the wilderness. He himself met all their needs. They weren't just out there wandering around. So look again at, at these verses in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And notice he says, all passed through the sea, all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, they were all identified with Moses. They had all experienced the same thing. They had all seen the, the miracles in Egypt. They had all experienced the plagues, and, and they had all been there for that first Passover. They had seen God open the Red Sea, so that they could cross on dry ground. They had seen God destroy the Egyptian army that, as they pursued them. 
None of these people were ignorant of the power of God. They had all seen it firsthand. And then it says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now we better pause here for a moment, for just a, a little bit, and, and think about Jesus Christ and the rock. If you remember a few days after the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, they ran out of water. They started complaining about Moses, blaming him for their situation. So Moses went to God and asked him what to do. And in Exodus 17, 5 through 6, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go Behold, uh, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people that the people may drink. And Moses did so in sight of the elders of Israel. Now this, this happened very soon after their crossing the Red Sea, when Israel had first begun its wilderness wanderings. And now the end of that 40 years, at the end of that 40 years or near it, a similar thing happened again. Israel was again out of water. And they again were again close to Mount Sinai. And again, Israel was by the rock, and again they complained to Moses who went to God. And so this was a repeat of the first time in many ways, but there was a difference. In Numbers 20, 7 through 11, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water, and thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. And so Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them here now you rebels must we bring water for you out of this rock and then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank did Moses do what God had told him to do no Moses had been told to speak to the rock. And in Numbers 20, 12 through 13, it said, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. The first time Moses was to strike the rock, and the second time he was only to speak to it. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10. It says, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now this is believed to be the rock that Moses was speaking to. And uh, this, this rock is near Sinai, or the mountain of God there, and uh, which is in Saudi Arabia, not, not the Sinai Peninsula, as we, we know from, from Scripture. And this rock is what we call a type or a picture of Christ. And actually, if you get a real close-up of this rock, you can actually see there's watermarks on it, which is, I think is fascinating because it's on top of a hill. Um, but this rock is to be a picture of Christ, and it was to be a picture of our salvation. Jesus was struck one time on the cross of Calvary. And now we have access to the Father through him. He was the ultimate sacrifice and will never be struck again. 
All we have to do is to present our request, request to him in prayer. We speak to him. And that was what the actions of Moses was supposed to picture. But because he became angry with the people, he disobeyed God and struck the rock a second time. He broke the type or the picture of Christ and our salvation. And the consequences for breaking that type was that Moses and Aaron were not allowed to enter the promised land. This was the incident that Paul is using as an example. Paul may have been thinking, or I think he was thinking of Moses and Aaron in this last verse in chapter 9 when he says this, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Moses and Aaron, by reacting in anger, destroyed the type and were therefore disqualified from leading Israel into the land of Canaan. They did not lose their salvation, but they lost an opportunity and a blessing. And again, we need to, to go back to our verses in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that, was, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The children of Israel had seen the power of God. They had experienced his saving grace. And the term, for they drank from that spiritual rock, indicates they were believers. You don't drink of Christ and not become a believer. But notice what Paul says next in 1 Corinthians 10.5, but with most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And the fact that they were believers didn't keep them from falling into sin. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 7, it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This, of course, is referring to that incident when Moses and Joshua went up on the mountain of God, leaving Aaron and the people of Israel and Moses had gone for some time, and the people got worried. And they went to Aaron, and they said, well, we don't know what happened to this guy Moses. So, so we want you to make a God for us. And you know the story. According to Aaron, he threw this gold into the fire, and out walked this golden calf. So they made this golden calf, and they feasted in front of it. And afterward, this scripture says that they rose up to play. In other words, they involved themselves in all of the debauchery that always accompanied idol worship. And again, it's important to remember the setting of the book, the setting of 1 Corinthians. Paul is writing to these people, and remember the city of Corinth was given over wholly to the pursuit of pleasure and indulgence. The people of Corinth, for the most part, worshiped the goddess Aphrodite. And these people were notorious for their sinful and debauched lifestyles. And we've seen that some of the Corinthian believers had fallen back into that life that they had lived before. The church had been started, and Paul going to the synagogue where he preached Christ. This was when he first came into the city. He knew what kind of a city he was coming into. 700,000 people who, and if you were in uh, the known world at that time and somebody lived an exceptionally immoral lifestyle, you'd say you're behaving like a Corinthian. Well, Paul went before, he, he, went, he went in there, he went to Corinth in Acts 18, 
4 through 7, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there, entered the house of a certain man named Justice, who one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So we know that, that there were many Jews that left the synagogue and joined the church in Corinth. We also know that the church being established in this kind of a city ran into some unique problems, and that was magnified also by the division in the leadership early in the church's history. So here Paul creates a link between the debauched lifestyle of the Corinthians and the depravity that was one time evident in the Jewish nation. He creates a link. And it's, the interesting thing is that Paul has now leveled the playing field between the Corinthians and their debauched lifestyle and the Jews in their their rebellion against God in the wilderness. And he makes it plain that one group does not have the moral high ground over the other group. Both alike are sinners. And then Paul goes one step further in his example of the, Christian, of the, the children of Israel in the, the wilderness. He makes it plain that they were under the cloud that they drank of the same spiritual drink and drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, which was Jesus Christ. It was believers who were behaving that way. Christians have a hard time reconciling in their minds the fact that believers can still fall into sin. But by and large, they say one of two things when they come across a professing Christian choosing an ungodly lifestyle. They will say either that person has lost his salvation or they will say he was never saved in the first place. Believers have trouble facing the fact that there's such a thing as a carnal Christian or a person who knows Christ but lives in sin. And in 1 Corinthians 9.27, it says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul was the most prolific writer in the New Testament, yet apparently he believed <coughs> that it was still possible for himself to be disqualified because of sin. It seems his biggest fear was that while he preached to others, that he himself should become unfit for service. And I can relate to that. That has been a fear of mine. I want to end well. Anyone can start well. I want to end well. But before we move on, let's, there's one other category that I want to mention here. There are another group of Christians, another group of another Christian circle that, who feel that people can actually progress to the place in their Christian lives where they no longer sin. Yet we do not see Paul ever indicating that as a possibility. As a matter of fact, we completely see the opposite. Paul realized that he himself, like Moses, could act independently from God and could sin to the point of being removed from service. <clears throat> And that, in fact, is what carnality is. Carnality is living your life independent from God and independent from his purposes, even when you're a believer. Well, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3 says, And brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. For you are still carnal. 
For where there is envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men or behaving like unsaved men? So carnality is living independent of God. Spirituality, on the other hand, in the biblical sense, is living, trusting, and being dependent on God. Paul clearly identifies He, but he, Paul clearly identifies the Corinthian believers as being carnal. Well, also, if you look at 1 Corinthians 5, 1, and then verses 4 and 5, it says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles or named among the unsaved, that a man has his father's wife. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Paul clearly states that there was sin going on among them that's not even mentioned among the Gentiles. And because of the the damage this carnal believer was doing to the cause of Christ, Paul recommends that he be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And he also makes it clear that the perpetrator of that sin is saved because he says that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. But that doesn't mean that he is free from the consequences of sin. Paul spends a lot of time here talking about carnal Christians, and we see that a believer can fall into gross sin and still be a believer. But again, there are consequences. In 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 10, it says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain as some of them did. As some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Notice how Paul puts this. He says twice, nor let us. He identified with these believers in the Old Testament. It's important to keep in mind that uh, he's talking to believers about other believers. And he mentions that these believers fell into sin and paid the consequences for that sin. If you're a believer, that, do, and that doesn't think that true Christians can fall into a sinful lifestyle, you may find that this train of thought offends your personal belief system. Keep in mind that this is not me saying this. This is the Word of God. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says, Now these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages has come. So the first thing we want to see here is that it says, all these things happen to them. In other words, this isn't an allegory. This isn't just a story. This really happened to people. And these things really happened, and they were written down for our admonition. And admonition is just another way of saying warning. This is, was written to believers about other believers. So the Holy Spirit made sure that these happenings were recorded so that we could learn by them. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If Paul didn't think it was possible for Christians to fall into sin, why would he say this? Now, the truth of the matter is, no matter who we are, there is within each of us the ability to go our own way. Now, I don't care if you, who you are or what experience you've had as a believer. If you think that you cannot sin, you deceive yourself. And 1 John 1.8 tells us that. 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. As a man or a woman, you may have accepted Christ, but you're still a fallen creature. You still have a sin nature. God didn't make us like robots, pre-programmed to respond one way or the other. When God created man, he created him with a mind, a will, and with emotions. A mind so he could know God, a will so that he could obey God, and emotions so that he could love God. We say man is a trichotomant being. After creation, or, or when God created man, he placed him in a garden told him that all the fruit that was in that garden he could freely eat. It's all, it's all for you, Adam and Eve. It's, it's there for you. All that is but the fruit of one tree. And that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So he made man with a will. And then he put a choice in the middle of the garden. He put a tree. He said, you... Everything in this garden is free for you to eat but this one tree. You have to choose. Are you going to eat of that tree or are you going to eat of everything else that I have provided for you? So he made man with a will. He placed him in the garden and he put a choice there. We find that all through life we have moral choices put before us. All through Scripture we see people given an opportunity to choose. And one example is, uh, like I said, we're going all over the place this morning, is Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which, were, which your father served and were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will choose the Lord. Joshua chose to trust or depend upon God and he placed that option before all the other Israelites. But knowing that we have a choice still doesn't answer the question of how a person can be a member of a church or in full-time ministry for years and fall into sin. Well, one of the biggest dangers I see among some Christian workers is spiritual arrogance. The belief that they are strong enough to resist evil. This is what's behind most pastors and missionaries falling into sexual sin. They, they fail to take into consideration the weakness of their own flesh. They somehow think that they're above the danger. So they fail to put safeties in place to protect themselves. They do foolish things like trying to counsel single women alone and many other things that actually set them up to fail. And although we don't want to dwell on our weakness, it's important to be conscious of them. It keeps us dependent on God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now let's look at the first phrase here. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. This basically says that no matter what temptation you are faced with, that temptation is not just unique to you. Don't think that you are anything special in the battle that you have to fight. But the temptation to sin is not sin itself. And God is faithful. God is your protector. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. When you're faced with temptation, you have a choice to either go with it or flee from it. 
Think of David. Or not David. You know, you can think of David. Well, David, David blew it with Bathsheba. He had a choice. But then think of Joseph. Put in the same situation. And he ran. Did Joseph think, well, I'm tough enough. I can just stand here and... Um... No, he ran. God's Word says that temptation will come into our lives. But he makes a way of escape. People give in to temptation because they choose to. This is one of the things that boggles our minds in regard to God. He's given us a will, but he's also sovereign. The error we make as believers is when we try to divorce those two things. Well, God is sovereign. Therefore, I don't have a will. Well, I have a will. I can choose. So that means God isn't sovereign. No. God is so sovereign that he can give you a will and not impact his sovereignty. He allows us to exercise our will, but he knows the end from the beginning. And because of the fact that God is sovereign, like I said, some attempt to deny that man has a will. But Scripture is too clear on the fact to deny it. As believers, we have a promise. God says he will never allow us to be tempted above what we're able to handle. That there is a way of escape, and sometimes that way of escape means run. There's always a right thing to do. God is God. He's the God of truth. And he's not going to allow his children to ever be placed in a situation where they're forced to operate in violation to his character. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. He's not going to allow his children to ever be placed in a situation where they're forced to operate in violation to his character. He's God and he's our Heavenly Father. He cares for us. Now, I know that this goes against some people's systematic theology. Do me a favor. Pitch your systematic theology and pay attention to what the Word of God says. We're not talking about a systematic theology. We're not talking about Calvinism versus Arminianism. We're talking about the Word of God. Pitch your theology, your systematic theology, and connect... To the Word of God. It is the authority, not some systematic theology. A systematic theology is man made. This is God breathed. Sorry, I, 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 I went from teacher mode to preacher mode. Uh, but God has given us a provision that's very important in our Christian lives. In Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. Believers are much more likely to fall into sin if they isolate themselves from the family of God. We have a very precious family in this church. We love one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. This is one of our safeties. Do not make the mistake of isolating yourself from the family of God. We are there, we are here constantly to encourage and walk with one another through this Christian life. And we need one another. Okay, well, thank you for listening.